if you have a Bible this morning, you would join me in Genesis chapter 4. Uh, we will pick up in our series in Mark sometime shortly. But as with last week, there's just uh, some things I want to share with the church, particularly this time of the year, new beginnings. And so this message will come from Genesis chapter 4 this morning about being accepted by God. I'm going to do something a little bit out of the normal here. I'm going to pray and then we're going to read Scripture. Let's pray and ask God to bless as we read His Word and hear it proclaimed. Our Father, thank you for a 46-year legacy in this church where the Word of God has been central. And week after week, year after year, decade after decade, there's been the expectation that the Word of God would be read and it would be proclaimed. And we do that, Lord, because you command us to. We do that because you've told us to preach the Word. We do that, Lord, because we believe your Word is sharp, it's powerful, it's able to convert the lost and to sanctify the saved. And so we pray this morning for your help as we read Scripture and as it's proclaimed, would you please give us ears to hear and hearts to understand. And we pray these things in Jesus' name, amen. Hear God's word from Genesis 4. Now Adam knew Eve, his wife, and I'm not going to preach on this, but it, interesting, the word knew there speaks of intellect, obviously speaks of intimacy, and the sexual act today in our society is completely a mindless thing. But Adam knew Eve, his wife, there was this intimacy, and she conceived and bore Cain, saying, I have gotten a man with the help of the Lord. And again, she bore his brother Abel. Now, Abel was a keeper of sheep and Cain a worker of the ground. In the course of time, Cain brought to the Lord an, an offering of the fruit of the ground. And Abel also brought of the firstborn of his flock and of their fat portions. And the Lord had regard for Abel in his offering. But for Cain and his offering, he had no regard. The picture is he, he paid no attention to it. So Cain was very angry, and his face fell. And the Lord said to Cain, Why are you angry, and why has your face fallen? If you do well, will you not be accepted? If you do not do well, sin is crouching at the door. Its desire is contrary to you, and you must rule over it. Well, it's 2019, it's a, it's a new year, and it's a time of new resolve. And it's great to have resolve at this time of year. Uh, I am noticing, I'm not sure if you are, but I'm noticing there's a lot more people that are out running this time of year. I would imagine the park runs are more full than they perhaps have been. Gyms are receiving new members while former members are making their way back to the treadmills. At this time of year, there's oftentimes a, a new resolve when it comes to diet and the weight control. Uh, the other night, my wife and I uh, were at a shopping mall, and she said to me, do you want to go for a Krispy Kreme? She said, because I'm starting a diet tomorrow. <laughs> and I share that with permission, by the way. But I thought that was a novel approach to a diet. Many people have renewed resolve to be fiscally healthy, to be academically diligent, and to be relationally stronger, and that's great. Well-being is usually at the top of our agenda when a new year begins, and may we all have a, a better year. But for the Christian, though those other things are important, our well-being is much more than improvement in those areas. For the Christian, our goal is, or at least it should be, to do well before our living Lord, to know Him, to love Him, to serve Him, to worship Him with our life 
As a Christian, we're driven by the desire to hear one day from our Lord and Savior, well done, good and faithful servant, enter into the joy of your master. The Christian is motivated by the desire that in whatever she is doing, she is doing it heartily as to the Lord. And like Paul, the conscientious Christian makes it our aim to be well-pleasing to him at all times. In other words, the Christian desires to so live that our life is one of acceptable worship. Paul wrote in Romans 12, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable under God, which is your reasonable service, your worshipful service. In other words, all that we do as a Christian is to be done with an attitude of, of worship. Hour by hour, day by day, month by year, month by month, year by year. We want to be pleased and acceptable before the Lord. And why? Well, as Paul said, the love of Christ constrains us. Because we've experienced the love of God in Christ, there's this constraint, there's this compelling that we want to love the Lord even more. But we all know that this is true, that desire is not enough. We need determination. We need discipline to carry out our duties to honor the Lord. And that's where the tacky hits the tar. How do we do that? Well, this morning I want to help us as we uh, kind of get some biblical traction for 2019, how we can live in such a way that the Lord will say to us, well done. In the words of our text, that we will do well and be accepted by him. Our text gives us grounds for this. Many are familiar with the story of Cain and Abel. A couple of weeks ago, one of my granddaughters called it the story of Abe and Cable. Um, but Cain, uh, Abel and Cain, two brothers, the first two brothers on earth, have a relationship that ends in a very tragic way. It ends in fratricide. The first homicide that takes place takes place within a family. In fact, it takes place with the context of worship. And there is one major theme in this that I want to barrel down and drill down into today, and that's this. The primary point of the passage is that of being accepted by God and therefore living acceptably for and before him. As I will show us in a moment, there is no more important issue in our life than being accepted by God. And when we know we're accepted by God, then and only then are we really moved to live in such a way that we are found acceptable, to, to, to be acceptable before him. If we answer this question right, how to be right with God, how to be accepted by him, that is wonderful eternal benefits. If we answer the question wrong, there is eternal tragedy that will never end. So this morning, let me help us to be able to leave here today committed to, in the words of our text, to do well. Three points, and the first one is this. The need is great. The need to be accepted by God is great. And we see this in the first five verses. In the first five verses, you have one brother. His worship is accepted. And another brother's worship is rejected. To be, re to be disregarded, to be rejected is painful. I don't know if you can uh, relate to this, but as a kid growing up, oftentimes my friends would get together at the local park and we'd play football. Um, a different kind of football, but we'd play football. And uh, we would pick teams. And it was always painful because they would start picking teams. I want Bob. And then the other guy said, I want Joe. And the, and the crowd was getting smaller. And then they would pick another guy, and then they pick another guy. And then usually at the end, they'd say something like this, okay, we'll take Doug. Shame. It's a sense of being rejected. That's always a painful thing. Sometimes... You hear those terrible words from the one that you love. Can't we just be friends? Maybe at work, you're rejected, you're passed over for a promotion, and that rejection can be deeply painful. But there is nothing that compares to the rejection that we see here in Genesis chapter 4. Rejection by God. There is nothing more painful. There is nothing more momentous then one day, perhaps standing for, before God and hearing the words of our Lord saying, depart from me, I never knew you. It's vital 
that we be accepted by God. That is what this text is about. You're familiar perhaps with the story. Adam and Eve are living now east of Eden. They're living in exile. They've been cut off from the garden of God, but thankfully they've not been cut off from God. And Adam and Eve find themselves obeying the very first commandment given to them in Genesis chapter 1 verse 28. They are being fruitful and multiplying. And Adam and Eve go to the marriage bed and Cain is conceived. And when Cain is conceived and she is born, and he is born, uh, Eve takes her child and she holds the child and, and his name is called Cain, which means gotten. And she said, I've gotten a man from the Lord. Very possibly she is thinking here in terms of Genesis 3.15. When God had made a promise that through her was going to, through a woman was going to come the seed, the savior, the deliverer. Maybe as Eve holds Cain, she's thinking to herself, here's the fulfillment of Genesis 3.15. Here is the savior of the world. She's soon going to be sorely disappointed. Some time goes by and she gives birth to another child. His name is Abel. And the word Abel, interestingly, means vapor. And that's prophetic because like a, a, a life that it's a vapor, his is going to vanish like this pretty shortly. Adam and Eve must have done a good job as parents as far as teaching their sons because we read in verse 2 that Abel was a keeper of the sheep and Cain was a worker of the ground. You find those two words in Genesis 2 15 where God put Adam in the garden to do both those things, to keep and to work. These are, as we saw last week, these are priestly terms. Here is, here, here is Abel and Cain, and at least externally, they are taking care of this new dwelling place of God. They are at least externally acting like priests. They also taught them well because the text tells us in verse 3 that in the course of time, literally the division of days, Cain brings an offering of the fruit of the ground. And Abel also brought of the firstborn of his flock in their fat portions. This phrase, in the course of time, speaks of a definite time. It seems that God had prescribed, or they were practicing, that at one particular day they would bring offerings to God. So Adam and Eve had taught Cain and Abel something about worship, at least the external aspect of it. And so perhaps it's the seventh day of the week, which would make sense that on the Sabbath, there was a time they knew they would bring their offerings. And so Cain brings of the fruit of the ground, and Abel also brings of the firstborn. I would gather from this that Cain had brought the first fruits of the ground, and Abel brought the first fruits of the flock. Abel also brought of the fat portions. It's interesting, Leviticus we see that God likes the, uh, the paleo diet, uh, that God likes fat, um, that the fat was the richest part, and that went to God, and Abel somehow understood that, and he brought that to God. And so it's a day of worship. And these brothers show up, perhaps with mom and dad, for this worship service, this weekly worship service, and they bring their offerings. But the text tells us something very significant. It tells us, in verse 4, and the Lord had regard for Abel and his offering, but for Cain and his offering, he had no regard. And the word regard means to observe, to inspect. The picture here is not God being passive in this process. He's very, very active. He's very present and he's very active. And he's watching Abel and, and Cain as they bring their offering. And at this day, it says that he inspected, and the implication is he inspects with approval Abel's off, Abel and his offering. Don't miss that. Regard for Abel and then his offering. But for Cain and his offering, he inspects and he is not impressed. The result of that is Cain is angry. The word pictures uh, fierceness, fury. It pictures a glowingness. He's very, very angry. And the Lord confronts him. Now, why did God reject Abel's offering, or sorry, Cain's offering? And why did he accept 
Abel's offering. Now, some say it's because of what they offered. That Abel offered an animal. And therefore, there would have been bloodshed. And so, because Abel offered a blood-shedding sacrifice, that's why God accepted Abel's sacrifice. And Cain brought of the fruit of the ground a grain offering, a meal offering, and that's why he rejected it. But there's a couple of problems with that. The most significant one is the text doesn't say that. Secondly, we're not yet into Leviticus. This is early in history, and we don't have any evidence of a prescription of a blood offering. We do have, in Genesis 3.21, the example of God clothing Adam and Eve with skins, which meant there was a death of an animal. So I don't doubt at this point blood was important, but understand that even under the Levitical law, many of the offerings that God prescribed were grain offerings. There's nothing wrong with a grain offering. And so, we're reading into the text if we say that the reason for this was because it was of what they offered. I think what they offered was, in one sense, irrelevant. No, the real issue is not what they offered, but it's how they offered. Go with me to Hebrews chapter 11. In Hebrews chapter 11, we find out why God rejected Abel's off, uh, Cain's offering and why he accepted Abel's. Look with me in verse 1. Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. For by it the people of old received their commendation. By faith, we understand that the universe was created by the word of God, so that what is seen was not made out of things that are visible. By faith, Abel offered to God a more acceptable sacrifice than Cain, through which he was commended as righteous, God commending him by accepting his gifts. And though his faith, and through his faith, though he, de he died, he still speaks. Would you notice verse 4? How did Abel offer? By faith. It was because he offered by faith that his sacrifice was more acceptable than that of Cain. The scriptures make it very clear to us why God rejected Cain and why he accepted Abel. And the whole issue there was what? Faith. In other words, Cain is simply going through the motions. Cain is like many a people in our own day. That they gather for worship, they sing the songs, they read the word, they hear the word, they bow their heads in prayer, but there's a disconnect with the living God. Abel, however, when he brings his sacrifice, he brings it with a heart that is believing God, that is trusting God. When you read through the scriptures and understand all that is behind faith, it is quite clear that as Abel comes to this day of worship and brings this offering, he brings this offering with a heart of dependence upon God. A heart not of self-righteousness, but a, a, a heart of, I need you, God, I'm dependent upon you. And God saw the external offering, but as God will say through Samuel to Saul, to obey is better than sacrifice. That God looks on the heart of those who claim to be worshiping. Abel offers his by faith. Cain, on the other hand, his offering is disregarded. 
It is rejected. It is not accepted because he comes with a heart of self-righteousness. And I would even suggest, based on his response, a heart of grudge. It wasn't so much what they offered, it was how they offered. But I want you to notice what is most important in this, back in Genesis chapter 4, when it says, In the course of time, Cain brought to the Lord an offering. Verse 4, Abel also brought of the firstborn of his flock and the fat portions. And the Lord had regard for Abel, and then... You could paraphrase his offering. But for Cain, he had no regard, and therefore for his offering. In other words, God wasn't looking at what was being offered. He was looking at the person who was offering it. That God had regard for, that God accepted Abel, and this is so important for us as Christians. He accepted Abel, And therefore, he accepted what Abel offered. In Cain's case, he did not accept Cain. And therefore, regardless of what Cain would have brought, that offering too would have been rejected. Now follow me. The key to all of this is understanding Hebrews 11. Because in Hebrews chapter 11, you have the writer of the Hebrews writing to Christians, Jewish Christians, who are undergoing intense persecution. Many of them are being tempted to pull away from Christ and to go back to the externals of the temple and the externals of the offering. But in chapter 10, the writer exhorts them and says, the just shall live by faith. He says, if your soul draws back, God says, I will have no pleasure in you. In in chapter 10 of Hebrews, the writer is exhorting them to go on and to draw near to Christ in verse 22. In chapter 10, he exhorts them, keep looking to Christ. And then he moves into chapter 11 to encourage them and says, look at the long history of people who came before you who trusted God, who by faith followed him, who by faith were loyal to him. Look at them as an example. What is really amazing about Hebrews 11 is that it's in the context of an entire book that is pointing people to Jesus Christ. And the conclusion of Hebrews chapter 11 is this, that every one of those individuals whether it was Abel, whether it was Enoch, whether it was Noah, whether it was Abraham, whether it was Moses, whether it was David, whether it was Samson, whether it was Daniel, whether it was all those unnamed people, all of those were looking ahead and trusting Jesus Christ. In other words, it was not a vague faith in God. You ever meet people when you say, are you a Christian? Well, yeah, I believe in God. You need to be well armed with that, for that. Because in James 2.19, James writes that the demons believe and they tremble. How many people that we talk to say they believe in God even tremble? It's not some kind of a vague belief in who God is. That's not what Hebrews 11 is speaking about. It's speaking about these Old Testament saints who actually, in fact, one of the examples is Moses in Hebrews 11. And it says that he had, that his focus was on the riches of Christ. Moses believed on the coming Christ. Abraham, as Jesus will say, rejoiced to see my day and was glad In Hebrews 11, all of these individuals who make it into that hall of faith, all of those individuals were those who were were persevering, not because of a vague belief in God, but because they believed in God's promised Messiah, the coming Lord Jesus Christ. Now, that helps us understand what's happening in Genesis 4. Because the text speaks about God having regard for Abel. Why? Because Abel was believing on Christ, and because he believed on Christ, that made him accepted, and therefore, 
as he continued to believe on Christ, what, it, what he offered was acceptable. There's a hugely important principle for us as Christians. That nothing that we offer to God will ever be acceptable until, first of all, we are accepted by God in Christ. You can give, you can empty your bank account and give it to God and it'd be completely unacceptable. You can lay your life down as a martyr and it not be acceptable. You can, you can be baptized so many times you look like a prune and that not be, and not be acceptable. You can serve and you can come to church and you can read your Bible and all of that, like Cain, be disregarded unless, first of all, you believed on Christ. That's vital. You say, well, Doug, we know that. I'm not sure we always know that. And I'm not sure that all who gather on the Lord's Day know that. As I was just saying to the membership information class, we never assume the gospel here. We never assume that anybody who comes here is really looking to the Lord Jesus Christ. Before you can ever live a life where you can do well before God, you have to, it has to be well with your soul. There must be a belief of a repenting of the sin and believing on the Lord Jesus Christ who died on the cross for our sins and who had lived a perfect life proving that he could forgive us of our sins, proving he could be our substitute. Once you do that, then God has regard for you and therefore what you offer is acceptable to him. It's so important. Today, I tried to engage as we sang the songs. I, I read those words and I, and, and I wanted to put my heart into that. But I'm sure that as I sang those songs, because I am still in this body, that there was probably some kind of a sinful distraction in my soul. That I wasn't completely engaged with God. When I give my, my, my offering to God by giving it to the church, I, I, I try for that to be a pure motive, but maybe sometimes there's an impure motive there thinking maybe I'll, I'll get from God if I do this. Or maybe as I give as much as I want to do, for, do it joyfully, there's a bit of a grudge. Whatever I do when I preach a sermon, I, I, I preach a sermon and I try to preach a sermon and keep myself out of, out of the way and, and not think about preaching so that somebody will say amen. I never have to worry about that. It's so easy for us as Christians to, to lose sight of the fact that even our best offerings are tainted with sin. That's why we need to know in our heart of hearts God, today when I gather to worship, I'm sure there's going to be some sin that taints this, but thank you that you have regard for me because by your grace, I believe I'm the Lord Jesus Christ. And because I'm accepted in the beloved, what I'm offering to you comes through him and therefore it is acceptable. Does that make sense? That should be an encouragement to us. We're looking to Christ. That's what Abel was doing as he, uh, as he offered by faith. He was looking to Christ, and that made his offering acceptable to God. The greatest need that we have is to be accepted by God. In some months down the road, and that's not a promise, but in some, well, yeah, in some months down the road, we're going to hit Mark chapter 11. In Mark chapter 11, you had this scene in verse 11 where Jesus enters the, the temple. And it's a strange kind of scene. He enters in in verse 11 and it says, when Jesus had looked on the temple and then pff, the, the, the whole subject changes. He leaves the temple. It's a strong word for looked. He goes and he inspects. He looks intently at what's happening in the temple. He goes away. Then he comes back a few days later and he cleanses the temple. You see, when Jesus went into the temple, he was doing exactly what God was doing here, east of Eden. He was, Jesus was observing those that were going about the externals of worship, and he was really looking to see what's happening in the hearts. He cleanses it, later he will destroy it. You see, we can go through all the motions of worship. We can even join a church, but if we have not been born again, if we have not been accepted in Jesus Christ, 
Everything else is just for show. There's nothing more important than knowing that we're accepted by God in Christ. And then that gives us the joy to sing. That gives us the joy to give. That gives us the joy to learn and to listen and to pray and to fellowship with one another. Cain, perhaps is like many who go to church, they come to church angry. Cain, it says, was very angry. And his face fell. His countenance dropped. Perhaps when he comes and he makes his offering, he does so with a, a smile. And he does so with a sense, perhaps, of self-satisfaction. And he's feeling pretty good about himself as he comes before God to make his offering. But as in some way God communicated that Abel was, accept, Abel was accepted and therefore his offering accepted. And God communicated that Cain was rejected and therefore his offering was rejected. He becomes very, very angry and his countenance falls. You know when we know that we're accepted by God, when we really rejoice in the gospel, when we rest in the gospel, That'll make a difference in our face. I don't know about you, but sometimes I really feel like I need a facelift. Do you ever feel that way? Apparently it's big business in South Africa. But I can save you a lot of money. The kind of facelift that really matters is the kind of facelift that we see here in this passage. Here was a man whose face fell. His face dropped. And he needed a face lift. What he needed was a faith lift. If Cain would have put his faith in Christ, then there would have been a change in his countenance. I think of Moses in Exodus 33 as he is meeting with the Lord and he comes down and then he goes into the tent of meeting and every time he'd go into the tent of meeting, he'd come out of that and he'd have to put a veil over his face because his face was shining. Remember that? I think of David in 2 Samuel chapter 6 when the ark returns to Jerusalem and David is, is, is dancing. He's happy. I can just, doesn't say this, but I can imagine this. His, faith, his face is shining. I think of Simeon and Anna we looked at recently in Luke chapter 2. When Simeon saw the Lord's Christ, I doubt he said, oh, there's the Lord's Christ. He saw the Lord's Christ and there was a, there was a beam and his face was lifted up. The same with Anna. The same with Marie Grice. I don't know if I've ever met anybody like Marie Grice. I said it at the funeral on Friday. Marie Grice who faced so much, so many adversities in her life. So much suffering. So much pain. And when I saw her in December, about a week before Christmas, I think it was, and she had started to, 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 to do better, she, seemed, she thought. And she was apologizing for the way she looked, and all I could see was the same Marie Grice I've ever seen. I saw someone with a countenance of joy. Dear people, when we really... Let the gospel get a hold of us. I'm talking about as Christians. When we grow in our understanding of what it means to be reconciled to God, to have our sins removed, to have that enmity removed, then our faces, whatever we're going through, they can be lifted up. We can have a face lift because of our faith in Jesus Christ. I shared at the funeral on Friday, Marie who would sit right back there. I miss her this morning, don't you? And I'd always go back and see her after I preach, and she'd always want to give me a kiss. I don't get a lot of that. And she wanted to give me a kiss. And she would grab my hands, and she, she'd say something oftentimes like, I think they're getting it. And what she meant was a sense of, because she always, she always thought that we were pretty conservative. I mean, she didn't see how wild we are today. But she said, I can, I can see in the singing there's, there's that excitement, that's enthusiasm. And I know there can be a, there's a phony kind of that. I'm not talking about that, obviously. But I'm saying that when you have 
the joy, joy, joy deep in your heart. It's going to show in your face, just like when you're not believing on Christ. It's going to show as well. Our greatest need is to know that we are accepted in the Lord Jesus Christ. To know that God sent his Son to live the perfect life that was demanded of us that we could never live. This story in Genesis 4 and everything past it proves that. And Jesus lived that life. And then he died the death that we deserved, experiencing the wrath of God. And when he, when he cried out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? We know the answer to that. He was forsaken so that he could embrace us. The Son of God become, became the Son of Man so that sons of men could become the sons of God. And as we repent and believe on him, it gives us great joy. Our lives are forever changed. But Christian, we need to continually hear that message and rejoice in that message and sing about that message and reflect upon that message. Rejoice in that. Make all the difference in how we offer to God. So the need is great. The solution is plain, but how will we respond? And that brings us to the second point quickly, is the choice is ours. Look at verse 6. He says, The Lord said to Cain, Why are you, you angry? Why are you angry and why has your face fallen? If you do well, will you not be accepted? There's a play on words there, by the way, in verse 7. And the word speaks about the fact that will your face not be lifted up? But if you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin is crouching at the door. His desire is contrary to you, but you must rule over it. A couple of things here are really important. I find here, and you don't want to miss this, God's wonderful, amazing, condescending grace. Because here are two brothers raised in the same home, pointed to the same Christ. One believes, the other does not. One is accepted, and therefore what he does is acceptable. One is rejected, and what he does is rejected. And yet God is not giving up on Cain. He confronts him. And he says, I see you are angry. Why are you angry? And why is your face fallen? Cain, the choice is yours. If you will do well, you will be accepted. If you don't do well, understand that sin, like a, 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 a wild animal, is there at the door. It is crouching and is waiting to lurch upon you. But you must rule over it. He's saying to Cain, the choice is your, yours. Will you do well and be accepted? Or quite literally, will you not do well and go to hell? We know sadly from Jude 11 about the way of Cain. Cain made the wrong choice, but he was given the option to do well. And again, I want to make this very clear. The doing well was not a matter of works. The doing well was a matter of, if you also, like Abel, will believe on the promised Redeemer, therefore you will be accepted. And when you're accepted, then what you do in my name will be accepted. The choice is ours. God in his grace condescends to confront Cain. What does it mean to do well? It means to take God at his word initially by believing on the Lord Jesus Christ. But it also, secondly, means taking God at his word continually. We believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. We take God at his word. We take the gospel at God's word and we repent and believe on him. But then we are to spend the rest of our days continually 
believing on him, continually living in such a way that our lives are acceptable. What does that look like? What does it look like? We know what it looks like to be saved by faith alone. It means renouncing self and believing on Christ alone. But what does it mean that just shall live, out, live by his faith? It means this, amongst other things. It means taking God's word seriously when it comes to Christian, forgiving those who ask for our forgiveness. When, if we're going to live a life that's acceptable to, to God, if we're going to live a life where we are doing well, then it's going to be a life of faith which involves forgiveness. It looks like responding to our enemies in love and praying for them and even blessing them. Do you ever find that difficult? How do we overcome that? We overcome that by the emphasis in our story here, by faith. God, this doesn't feel good. This person is maligning me, and this person is seeking to destroy me, and this person is, 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 is hurting me. There's something that doesn't seem normal or natural about blessing them and praying for them, and that's when God comes to us and says, by faith, take me seriously, take my word seriously, and pray for them. It means, by faith, seeking God's kingdom first, Matthew 6, It means not losing heart as you face adversity and adversaries and perplexities and discouragements. It means casting your care upon him, trusting him to care. It means loving your difficult spouse. It means honoring your difficult parents. It means loving and disciplining and training your difficult child. It means giving to the Lord in difficult times. It means by faith, keeping your mouth shut when tempted to backbite and to gossip. It means by faith, continuing to pray. It means by faith confronting a brother or sister who needs rescuing and on and on and on. Christian, if we're going to do well, we're going to do well the same way we'd be started well, by faith. Hebrews 11 is all about that. Hebrews 11 is all about those by faith, by faith. They, they acted upon God's word because of a confidence in his character. The choice is ours. We have a year where we do well or where we cave in to Sin that is crouching at the door. The evil one who was crouching in the garden is still crouching east of Eden. He's still crouching at our lives and as we are faced with an opportunity to, by faith, do that which is well, to do that which is pleasing to God, we have sin, the world, the flesh, and the devil that are crouching there seeking to oppose us. We need to rule over that. And have the victory in such a way that God is pleased. We must have dominion over that which desires to destroy you. And finally, we have to understand that there's a conflict, but the battle is of the Lord. We read in verse 7, its desire is contrary to you, but you must rule over it. What will Cain do? What will be his choice? Verse 8 tells us, Cain spoke to Abel, his brother. And when they were in the field, Cain rose up against his brother Abel and what? Killed him. We have to understand that the Christian life, when we're accepted by God in Jesus Christ, and we set our hearts on then doing well. We set our hearts on faithfully serving the Lord. When we do that, we are entering into a conflict, yes, with the world, the flesh, and the devil, but we're also entering into a conflict with those who are going the way of Cain. In fact, John will write in 1 John 2,000 years later, in this, the children of God and the children of the devil are manifest. Whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor is he who does not love his brother. For this is the message that you heard from the beginning, that we should love one another, not as Cain, who was of the wicked one and murdered his brother. And why did he murder him? Because his works were evil and his brother's righteous. Do not marvel, my brethren, if the world hates you. Being accepted by God puts us 
into his family. It puts us into his, on his side, and it puts us against the side we were rescued from, the devil's side. And so there's going to be this conflict, and everything from Genesis 4 through the rest of Scripture is all about this conflict. But like Abel, who believed, as Hebrews 11.39 says, having not received the promise, we continue to believe, in, even in the midst of conflict, even in the midst of a, of a Christ-rejecting world that, seem, that, that, that seeks to, to devour us, that seeks to destroy us, in the face of that, in the face of the world, the flesh and the devil that want to deter us from doing well and serving God, we, like Abel, by faith, need to say, a better day is coming. We live in the day of a new heaven and a new earth, but it's the already not yet. There's coming a day when no longer is sin going to be crouching at the door. No longer are you going to have, are you going to have man against man. No longer is there going to, be, is there going to be discord. There's going to be a complete reconciliation and restoration as Jesus Christ returns. And like Abel, even though we have not yet received that promise, like Abel, we can believe God for it. In the meantime, say, you know what? This battle that we're in, the battle really is the Lord's and he has guaranteed the result. If these believers in the old covenant, going way back to Abel, the first example, if these believers could trust God and believe God without the full gospel having been revealed, how much more should we live on this side of the cross? We've seen God's faithfulness. We've seen that God keeps his word. And therefore, in 2019, let's act like we believe God will keep his word. Let us live like Abel, by faith, knowing that we're accepted in God, and therefore, by faith, living in a way that's acceptable to him. You know, one of the greatest things I ever read 35 years ago was a book by A.W. Tozier. And there was a chapter, and I never forgot it. It was called this, God is easy to live with. So oftentimes, we think of God as a cosmic policeman. And as Christians, we can labor under that fact that God is never pleased with us. That God will never accept what we do. That's a wrong view of God. The right view of God is that he sent his only begotten son, that through him we might be saved. And as we see that, we realize that God is easy to live with, because not because of who I am and because of what I've done, but because of who his son is and what he has done. And because I'm accepted in him, I can make my daily offerings and worship to him, knowing that through Christ they are acceptable. It gives me joy, that lifts my face, and that lifts my faith. May God do that for a church, for our church this year, perhaps as never before. Let's pray. Our Father, we thank you for your condescending grace. Thank you that before we experienced that grace, we were, we were all in the way of Cain, trying to just ourselves, justify ourselves before you, trying to earn your favor with all kinds of offerings. And yet, Lord, by your grace, you confronted us and showed us the, our desperate need and our hopelessness apart from your Son. Thank you for giving us hearts to repent and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And thank you that because of that, we are accepted in the Beloved. But Lord, help us now to, to be active with that truth. And as Paul wrote, that 
whether present or absent, we would be found pleasing to you. That we live lives of faithfulness to you, looking to you, taking your word seriously, obeying it in the midst of opposition. That one day we'll hear from you, well done, good and faithful servant, enter into the joy of your master. We long for that, but Lord, we also long to experience joy before we get there. So may this be a year of, in the midst of perhaps some real conflict that some of us will face. Perhaps physical adversity and other matters that would seek to pounce on us and destroy us. Help us to, to master that by looking to Christ, doing what is right, and then experiencing the joy of the Lord. And Lord, please finally save those in this room today that have not yet accepted Christ. May they know what it means to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ with all of their heart, to make that confession with their mouth and be saved. And we pray these things in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen.